I don't know about unfogging, but what we're going to start with is Julian, who is going to set the scene. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I think when I was told I was setting the scene, that's barristers speak for the warm-up act. Um, I'll be handing over to the, to, the, to the panel over there for the more detailed analysis. I'm going to give you some stats, and, uh, and as Finn said, from a transactional lawyer's perspective, just give you an indication of the sorts of transactions where English law is, is to go to uh, governing law choice, and the English courts or English arbitrational seat is, uh, is, the, is, is the, the chosen uh, place to litigate as well. So some stats from a recently published City UK publication. 314,000 people are employed in private practice throughout the UK in the legal services sector. Legal services sector contributed 25.7 billion uh, to the UK economy, which represented 1.6% of UK gross value add. Uh, and that's the contribution of the legal sector to the economy and it generated a trade surplus of 3.4 billion, all of which obviously demonstrates that English law is, at the moment, very healthy. A few more stats. UK accounts for 10% of global legal services fee revenue. 200 law firms have their offices in London or, or outside in, in the, in the um, wider UK. Four of the 10 largest firms in the world based on revenue uh, have their main base operations in the UK and two of the largest law firms by headcount also have their main operations in the UK. Uh, I should say that the other uh, largest law firms are headquartered in, in the US. And then again, some surveys which were done, some, some not so recent, uh, a couple that have been done in the last few years. This one was from 2008 uh, and involves respondents from France, Germany, Italy, uh, Holland, Poland, Spain, U the UK and Belgium. And they were asked a series of questions about uh, choice of governing law to govern cross-border contracts. And as you'll see, uh, a large number of the respondents uh, indicated that the UK uh, and English law was their, their, their preferred choice. And interestingly, 21% of them said they wouldn't choose US law uh, as the, the governing law of their, of their contracts. A few more stats. Again, these are taken from surveys. Some of them are older than others. Um, various European country respondents were asked about the law they most often used in cross-border transactions. And again, they said 26% of the time it was English law. And those were countries, um, again, uh, Netherlands, Poland, Spain, UK, Germany, and France. Uh, and then the, the more interesting stats, I think, on this one are the, the last two. So a survey of 500 commercial practitioners and in-house counsel conducted by the Singapore Academy of Law found that 48% of them identified English law as their preferred choice of, uh, of contractual governing law. That was a survey that the Singapore uh, Academy did in order to see how popular Singapore arbitrational proceedings were because they were trying very hard to push it as something which should become a, a major choice for people certainly in Asia. And in fact, they got an answer that was, I think, the opposite of the one they were hoping for. And then likewise, a survey done by the practical law in China uh, showed that where contracts didn't require or weren't mandated to include a Chinese governing law clause, uh, a large number of those contracts would then be governed by, by English law. And then again, just adding some, some gloss onto all of that, two-thirds of claims issued by... Uh, the commercial courts involve at least one party from outside England and Wales. Of 705 rulings by the commercial court between March 2008 and March 2013, 61% of the litigants were from outside the UK, which I think is an interesting stat. Uh, English law is the governing law in 40% of all global corporate arbitrations. And according to the LCIA, 16% of its cases in 2012 involved parties from Russia and the CIS. And that is actually likely to be closer to 30% when you take into account that a lot of Russian uh, corporate vehicle, a lot of Russian corporate transactions are done using Cypriot vehicles and BVI vehicles. And so we think that number is probably a lot higher than the 16% uh, that they indicated. Uh, and again, just, just more, more information about how popular English law is. Uh, members of the commercial bar 
uh, we're instructed to appear as advocates or experts in 40 international arbitrational centres and courts in 25 jurisdictions globally. Uh, and there are a number of uh, jurisdiction, English jurisdiction clauses included in industry standard documents. So you'll see them in uh, LMA, LMA, LMA documentation, which is the Loan Market a a Association, and also in the ISDA Master Agreement. So what influences the choice? I think these are all things which you'll all be familiar with. In fact, the Ministry of Justice did a survey in 2015, uh, which was entitled, um, uh, they, they were actually trying to establish exactly what did drive people to, to choose English law. Uh, and its purpose was to improve the understanding of the drivers behind the decision of litigants to initiate commercial litigation and where they brought that litigation. Uh, and some of the stats, uh, some, some of the information on this page has been taken directly from that survey. And these are the things that we talk to our clients about when you've got clients who have no nexus to the UK and they ask you what governing law clause uh, they should choose uh, and what dispute resolution provision they should choose. We tend to run through these as the headings uh, and you can pretty quickly whittle down which jurisdictions are the ones where uh, you should be looking and, and often they'll conclude rightly that, that the UK uh, basically covers all of these specific points shouldn't under, underestimate how important English language is uh, as the choice of most global businesses in, 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 in these sorts of transactions. It's clearly a lot easier to um, resolve a dispute of a contract that is governed by English law with the English courts that's in English. Uh, we often run into trouble where we translate uh, English concepts into foreign law. So there are some words that are, have a very obvious meaning in English law that have, have a, a much, un, much less clear meaning under uh, under certain foreign laws. So the word trust, for example, in French law is slightly different as it is in German law. And then as a sort of add-on to that, uh, clearly choosing an English law clause and an, and an English litigation clause means you get the best, best of both worlds. You get an English uh, court deciding uh, about things to do with their own national law uh, and it's almost invariably going to be in English, English language as well. I won't go into these in any particular detail. Again, these all come from this uh, Ministry of Justice paper and it's pretty uh, obvious. Um, the only one that's probably worth noticing is the last one, reluctance to rewrite commercial contracts. That's a very important part of uh, how we advise our clients. I mean, the English courts look at a, what's written on the paper and, and decide that that is basically what the parties agreed and therefore that's what they're going to, uh, to, to, to focus on. Whereas there are some courts where they do take a kind of unfair bargain approach to certain things and you can end up in a situation where the decision is not necessarily based on what's written on the paper. So you get a, a much more higher degree of certainty. English arbitration, again, why do people choose it? Uh, and and whether, it will, whether it will change as a consequence of what we're about to talk about in the context of Brexit. Um, clearly, arbitration is not linked to the membership of the EU. Um, it's enforced through the New York Convention, of which there are 150 signatories currently. Um, and a recent survey, and I think if you add these numbers up, just so you're aware, they do add up to over 100, which is um, because I got the, the question slightly wrong. So in a recent survey where respondents were asked, what are your organization's three preferred seats? 47% uh, said, said London, 38% uh, said Paris, and in fact, 30% said Hong Kong. Uh, and then it was 24% with Singapore, so that's why it adds up to over 100. The same survey asked, over the past five years, which seats have you or your organization used the most? And that came out with 45% as being London, uh, followed by Paris, Hong Kong, and Singapore. So, from my perspective, as a, as a transactional lawyer at Freshfields, where do I often see uh, English law provisions used in contracts where the the parties to those, those contracts have nothing to do with the UK. The transaction has nothing to do with the UK. Uh, and I thought securities offering was a good one to start with. Uh, so public offerings by European companies, a lot of those are done under English law. Uh, and certainly uh, up until the wave of privatization through Central Europe a few years back, you even had German companies doing equity offerings under English law, uh, French companies doing equity offerings under English law, debt offerings, all sorts of things. Uh, in Germany and France, that's changed a bit since their privatizations, and they now tend to use French law or German law. Uh, but places like Holland uh, and various other the Benelux countries certainly still use English law. Sorry, I'm going the wrong way. And the same is true of public equity offerings by Middle Eastern companies. 
uh, and, and, and that is demonstrated, again, the same sort of thing. No necessary listing in London. This is a Middle Eastern company doing a listing in Dubai uh, where there'll be, say, an international bank involved, and it's quite often the, 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 the presence of an international bank that will drive them to choose English law. Uh, but again, no, no connection to the UK at all. Uh, public, offering, public equity offerings and private placements by sub-Saharan companies, particularly South Africa. We were working on a transaction that announced this morning, a company called Dischem Pharmacies, which is a South African pharmacy business. Uh, it's listing in Johannesburg. Uh, there's no listing in London. Uh, there's no connection to London at all. Uh, that is being done under English law. Uh, the placement agreement is, is governed by English law, and the courts of England have exclusive jurisdiction. And then, again, a very common theme in, in securities offerings by uh, Russian and CIS and CEE companies, almost all transactions done by, uh, by companies in those jurisdictions use English law. And one of the examples uh, that I was um, uh, given by one of my colleagues was a company called Boretz. It's a Russian company. It's an oil services company. It redomiciled to Dubai. It's a quite an unusual deal. Uh, it's a fully Russian business. Uh, so it's now a Dubai top co for that business, and all the contracts it enters into, both public and private, uh, are governed by English law. And then just going on for a few more examples, as I said, a lot of the major Russian CIS CE corporate deals are done under English law. That's the default position, and indeed a lot of Russian domestic deals uh, are done under English law rather than Russian law. Private M&A transactions uh, all around the world are done using English law. Um, in my mining practice, I do a lot of work in Latin America, uh, and the two choices of law that companies tend to look at the most are English and New York law. Uh, it tends to be the, 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 the parties themselves and where they're located to decide which of those two laws they go for. So if you've got two English companies doing a deal in, let's say, Chile or Brazil uh, or Peru, they'll often choose English law to govern the, the contract. If it's, if it's an English company and a, and a, and a and a, and a US company, then they'll often use US law. Private equity transactions are either done under English law or New York law. Um, if it's a New York asset, it'll be done under New York law, as you'd expect. But outside of the US, uh, it's almost exclusively done under English law. So wherever the transaction's done, even if it's involving US private equity funds, they will uh, use English law. And I think we're all aware of the number of oligarch disputes that go on in London uh, and, and there are a number of reasons why they're done in London. I think the third bullet is the most important. English law recognises all contracts, and a lot of these disputes are around things that were said uh, many years ago that people are now disputing. In terms of other examples, uh, and there's a, there's a raft of them. I'm conscious I don't have very much time, uh, but there's a whole raft of things that you wouldn't necessarily expect to be governed by English law. Uh, debt restructurings. People actually go out of their way to try and get um, into a situation where they can they can use uh, the English scheme of arrangement, creditor schemes of arrangement for debt restructurings. And there are a number of ways of doing that. You can either change all the governing law clauses of the agreements into English law. Uh, you can shift your center of main interest to again come within the scope of the English uh, scheme of arrangement provisions. You can insert an English new co uh, into the structure to try and ensure that again, the English courts have some jurisdiction over what's going on. Uh, or you can effectively uh, insert a new co who assumes all the debt uh, by way of a deed poll, again, to get within the English scheme of arrangement rules. So again, we're, doing, we're seeing restructurings throughout Europe that are being done using English creditor schemes of arrangement. So what will English law mean after Brexit? I think the key point, and I hope it's going to be discussed by, by the other panellists, is, is certainty. Um, uh, they'll go through all the issues that would need to be addressed. Uh, I've seen their slides, and, and it's the stuff that we're talking to our clients about quite a lot at the moment. Um, there's all sorts of talk about the Great Repeal Act, which will repeal all European law and then immediately say it's all subject to, it's now now part of English law. How that works in practice, uh, there's a lot of detail that's going to have to be worked out on that, uh, to say the least. Uh, a lot of it will, will just simply be transposed into English law. Some of it can't be, so there'll have to be some changes. Um, and how that all fits together is, is going to take a long time, uh, we think. Uh, who has the power to amend and repeal EU law once it's converted into English law? Um, there's a suggestion that Parliament will want to do everything. Uh, you think about the volume of, of law that's out there that's going to have to be amended or converted or changed 
question is whether Parliament actually has the capacity to, to do that. Uh, and then does it become the government that does that, and is that something which people will feel comfortable with? And then finally, something which, uh, again, hopefully will be touched on by, by others, uh, what, what will the status of decisions that have been made by the Court of Justice of the European Union be once we, we leave the European Union? Uh, no one is entirely sure, no one's quite sure how you will interpret things, uh, and how it will be applied in, under English law once all these laws are part of uh, English law rather than EU law. Uh, do we have certainty at the moment? I think the answer is pretty clearly no, um, but hopefully over, over time we will get a little bit more. And then what are we hearing? Um, what are we hearing from other people? Will Brexit make English law less attractive to business? It shouldn't do. Um, other countries have for a while been trying to hear, for example, English, English um, cases in their own courts, so Singapore and and Germany have been trying to do that. But there are people who are saying stuff. Um, I've slightly embellished the first quote. Um, I wasn't going to name the person who, who made it, uh, but suffice to say, it's, a, it's a, a leading Indian lawyer who um, said that Brexit means the end of English law as an international law of commerce and business. He didn't go on to say, uh, and therefore businesses should now choose the laws of other jurisdictions, but that was clearly part of what he was saying. Uh, there have been lots of comments by other law firms, mainly... Uh, relatively benign, simply pointing out that there is a bit of uncertainty and therefore things, uh, uh, people should be thinking about jurisdiction clauses and, uh, and it's something which should be higher up the agenda once we, once we trigger Article 50. Uh, and there are various other things which, again, from an EU law perspective, are mandated. Um, there are various things to do with bail-in, which are all dependent upon uh, England being part of the UK being part of the EU. Once you're outside the EU, then it, that, that triggers certain contractual requirements that you have to put into contracts going forward. Some of these contracts will obviously have uh, a lifetime that will last much longer than the two and a half years we've got before we leave the, the EU, and therefore how you deal with that is something which we're all grappling with at the moment. I think that was my warm-up act, if that's okay. Thank you very much, Julian. Uh, that certainly sets the scene as to the importance of English law. The uncertainty that Julian refers to, we all know, arises from the fact that in issues of jurisdiction, enforcement and conflict of laws, our law has very much become dependent in many respects on EU regulations. So Richard Aikens is now going to talk about one aspect of that, the Brussels regulation regime, and what the future might hold, hold for us post-Brexit. Thank you very much, Helen. Well, yes, I, I think I did... Uh, coin this title, Fog in Channel, Continent Cut Off. Is that where we are at? Well, let's have a look at the present position. Uh, uh, the basic rule is Brussels 1 recast, as we all call it, or B1R, and that sets out the rules for jurisdiction of courts in civil and commercial matters as between member states, and it also deals with recognition of judgments and enforcement of judgments according to that jurisdiction regime. There is also, as I'm sure all of you will know, the Lugano Convention 2007 that deals with the jurisdiction rules between EU member states, Switzerland, Norway and Iceland, not Liechtenstein, which is an EFTA member, but it doesn't sign up to that. Uh, and that was concluded, and this is important, uh, by the European Commission on behalf of all EU member states, and it has direct effect in the UK under the 1972 Act because the convention was made an EU act, uh, as you can see if you read in the official journal, I've given you the reference there. Some key points about B1R and Lugano 2007. Just looking at it historically, uh, since I first became involved with what was the Brussels Convention, uh, one's learned to live with a new set of rules. It was quite difficult to start with. But they settled down. We learned to live uh, with looking at ECJ decisions and what they meant. And over the years, it's become a set of well-settled rules. They've been developed for siding jurisdiction in the English courts in relation to cross-border disputes in civil and commercial matters involving EU member states. And we're all used to operating them now. B1R... Uh, has much improved uh, the previous regulation known as Brussels 1 and uh, very much improved on the old Brussels Convention. The uh, English uh, lawyers uh, and uh, English uh, civil servants were very much involved 
with the construction of B1R and pressed very hard for a number of things in it, particularly in relation to arbitration and uh, the ability to enforce jurisdiction clauses because of the importance of English law and English jurisdiction clauses, which we've heard all about from Julian. So just a few points uh, which emphasize why B1R is important. The arbitration exception, arbitration is outside uh, the whole of uh, Brussels, has been from the beginning, but it's never been very clear what this extends, uh, what this extends to. There have been lots of English cases uh, which have debated the thing. Uh, the uh, European Court in the West Tankers case, you'll remember, uh, said um, it, it, notoriously, some would say, no anti-suit injunctions can be issued by an English court to prevent uh, parties going off to another jurisdiction in breach of an arbitration clause. So uh, the arbitration exception has now been very much explained, but my view is that West Tankers itself remains good law, and there's nothing in the recent Gazprom case uh, which says that we can have anti-suit injunctions again. Enforcement of jurisdiction clauses, regardless of domicile of the parties, so worldwide now instead of just in uh, EU member states. Enforcement of jurisdiction, sorry, Italian torpedo, now effectively disarmed in cases where there are jurisdiction clauses. You used to be able to get round that because of a case called the Gasser case, uh, and now that's been uh, effectively uh, torpedoed itself by Article 31.2. Lastly, there is uh, now a measure of forum convenience reg regarding courts of states outside the EU by virtue of the new Articles 33 and 34, although the circumstances in which it can be used are limited, but it's an advance. Lugano 2007 is effectively Brussels 1, i.e. The, the regulation of 2001. Of course, as we all know, issues of interpretation of B1R have to be decided by the CJEU. Even for Denmark, it's fought hard against that, uh, but now it, it's an adherent of Brussels 1. Uh, it is also within the CJEU's jurisdiction for deciding issues of interpretation. Lugano 2007 is different. The second protocol recognizes the danger of divergent interpretations of Brussels 1 and Lugano 2007, but the CJEU does not have jurisdiction over the courts of Switzerland, Norway, and Iceland on issues of interpretation of Lugano 2007, but it does if an issue arises from an EU member state court, then they are obliged under their treaty obligations to uh, send the matter to the CJEU. What do they do with uh, Lugano? Uh, as you can see, it requires that the states courts apply to uh, an interpretation, an interpreting, applying an interpretation, it should be, sorry, of Lugano 2007. They must pay due account to the principles laid down by any relevant decision concerning the provisions of the Brussels Convention 1968 as amended the old Lugano and Regulation 44-2001. So what's the effect of Brexit 1 in relation to this, uh, what I'm going to call broadly, the Brussels uh, regime? I assume Article 50 is, treasured, uh, is triggered one way or another before March 2017. I know that may be regarded as a big assumption by some, but I'm going to assume it. Article 52 contemplates the EU and the withdrawing state concluding a withdrawal agreement. That's the wording used after notification has been given. Then Article 53 provides that the treaty shall cease to apply to the state in question from the date of entry into force of the withdrawal agreement or failing that two years after the notification unless the European Council, in agreement with the member state concerned, unanimously decides to extend this period. Thus, no withdrawal agreement, no extension, <coughs> Article 53 will have effect and the treaties will cease to <coughs> apply. The treaties are the Treaty of European Union and the Treaty on the Function of the European Union. Article 288 of the latter states that a regulation shall have general application, it shall be binding in its entirety and de directly applicable to all member states. So no treaty, no applicable regulation. 
You can look at it through the eyes of the European Communities Act 1972. That gives effect under Section 2 to all such rights, powers, liabilities, obligations, and restrictions from time to time created or arising out of the treaties. Under the definition of treaties, it's in Section 1, uh, they include uh, the TEU and the TFEU. So if the treaty ceased to have an effect in the UK under Article 50, there's nothing left for Section 121 to bite on. That is my interpretation of it. So my view, and I think certainly most of the commentators that I've read, are that this will mean in the absence of any withdrawal agreement after the two-year period has expired, and assuming there's no prolongation agreed, then B1R and its predecessor regulation 44 2001 and Lugano 2007 will cease to have any effect in the UK. So the first big question is what, if anything, will be left? And I've called this the default position after Brexit. Section 2, subsection 1 of the Civil Jurisdiction and Judgments Act 1982, old friend, remains in force. And that says that the Brussels Conventions, note the plural, have the force of law in the UK and judicial notice shall be given of them. Plural is there to encompass Lugano 1988, the 71 Protocol to the Brussels Convention, which gave the ECJ, as it then was, jurisdiction to interpret Brussels and various accession conventions as new countries joined the EC and then the EU. When Brussels 1 was agreed in 2000, Article 68 stipulated that it would supersede, that's the word used, the 1968 Brussels Convention. But it continued to apply that, that the it is the Brussels Convention as between Denmark and the other then EC member states. The Brussels Convention also applied to various territories that were within the terms uh, of the Brussels Convention but excluded from Brussels 1 by Article 299 of the Maastricht Treaty. There are similar provisions in B1R about it superseding the Brussels Convention, but Denmark is now within B1R. So, although the current practical significance of the Brussels Convention is virtually nil, it applies to a few French overseas territories and to uh, the Netherlands Antilles uh, I'm not quite sure whether it's an island or a little speck uh, called Aruba, but it still has this, the Brussels Convention still has the force of law in the UK, save insofar as uh, the B1R has effect, see section 1, subsection 4 of the 1982 Act. In my view, the Brussels Convention still exists as an international law instrument between all the states that signed it. Article 68 of Brussels 1 and in B1R stipulate that they supersede the Brussels Convention as between member states. Once the UK ceased to be such, then, in my view, it's arguable that means the Brussels Convention will come to the fore again because we won't be a member state. Would the Brussels Convention apply to all EU member states that did not expressly sign it because they joined the EU or the EC, then the EU, after Brussels 1 in 2000. I think it's arguable uh, that it would because of Article 63 of the Brussels Convention, which has the effect of requiring new member states to adhere to it by the mechanism of the existing member states undertaking to get them to do so. That's the only way that the Brussels Convention can apply as between them and the territories that are outside the scope of Brussels 1, then B1R. So you've got to draw in the new people in order that there's some kind of jurisdiction regime as between uh, those territories that are outside B1R uh, but still uh, need to be dealt with somehow. But if this became relevant and there was any doubt about it, then the issue would ironically have to be tested in the CJEU because of the 1971 protocol which gave the European Court the jurisdiction to interpret the Brussels Convention. And that protocol remains in force. What about Lugano? That will cease to have effect upon Brexit uh, because of Article 216 of the TFEU and Section 1 of the ECA. 
Article 69.6 of the Lugano 2007 stipulated that it shall replace the earlier Lugano. It's doubtful whether, as an international law instrument, the earlier convention still exists. And all references to that convention in the CJJA were removed and replaced by references to the 2007 convention. And in my view, there'd be no legal sense in trying to resuscitate references in the CJJA to the 1988 convention if it has ceased to be an international law instrument. It wouldn't bind anyone. So this will mean that as between the UK and Switzerland, Norway and Iceland, there would be no existing jurisdiction enforcement regime at all, or at least none that we could be sure about. So what needs to be done? In my suggestion, urgently. And if there are government lawyers in the room, may, may I please emphasize the word urgently. The EU and the EEA, or EFTA countries, will remain, remain important trading partners of the UK. Julian's already explained that to us, whatever type of trade deal is struck. Julian's already shown us how important cross-border civil and commercial litigation is, and that applies uh, to the UK and other EU, EEA states, and it's going to be an important element of civil and commercial litigation in the UK and those states. Enforcement is still going to be vital to everyone. So it's important, in my view, to have common rules on jurisdiction and enforcement across as wide a group of states as is possible. So what's going to be the best regime for the UK and how is it to be achieved? Well, what I call the easy bit is uh, B1R. We want to have that if we can. Uh, and as I said, the UK pressed for the improvements in the negotiations. So we want to be able to continue to participate in that. How do we do it? By having a bilateral <coughs> treaty between the UK and the remaining EU member states along the lines of the EU-Denmark, sorry for my mistyping, Treaty of 2005, which brought Denmark into Brussels 1. The B1R terms would be given the force of law in the UK by a very straightforward amendment to the CJJA. I suspect there'd be little political objection to the UK or the remaining EU member states of such a treaty in principle, but there are the difficult bits. And the first one is dealing with amendments. As Julian has already pointed out, the law is not static, it changes. The UK would want to be involved in that so that it remained, as it were, in line. That has, was a problem with Denmark. Uh, it wasn't allowed to uh, have some kind of mechanism whereby it could take part in the discussions which led to B1R. All it could do was adhere to them, uh, and I've given you the reference to the article in the EU-Denmark agreement. The UK, I'm sure, would wish to preserve its right to decide on whether to enter independently into other international agreements. I've given the example of the Hague Convention on Choice of Law Agreements. That's in force at the minute, as between EU member states, apart from Denmark and Mexico. Uh, it takes effect in the UK through uh, Article 216 of TFEU, but it wouldn't have any effect after Brexit unless provision is made for it separately. There's another preliminary draft convention on recognition and enforcement of judgments which is a part of the Hague Conference on Private International Law, currently being considered, and we would want to uh, be sure we could uh, do something about that. Most difficult of all is the issue of the jurisdiction of the CJEU, a political hot potato. How's that to be resolved? Take Denmark as the example. The courts of Denmark have to refer issues of interpretation to the CJEU, as would the courts of any other member state. Is that politically difficult for the UK? I'm not going to get into the politics of it, but a possible solution, if compromise were in the air, is to use Articles 1 and 2 of the Protocol 2 of the Lugano Convention 2007. That uh, is that the, the various courts uh, of the, the countries involved there outside the EU have to pay due account to the principles laid down in any decisions regarding Brussels' Lugano regime, instruments by the CJEU and the ECJ. 
Would that be politically difficult for the EU? Maybe, but it's accepted it for the other states that are uh, non-member states of the EU. So, perhaps uh, that is possible. Well, if none of that can happen, if we can't sign up to B1R, is there a fallback position? And the answer is yes, adherence to Lugano 2007, uh, and then we would enter into a treaty with the EU and the relevant EFTA states to adhere to Lugano 2007, and there are provisions under that uh, to, for us to do so as a non-EU member state, and uh, assuming we are not part of uh, EFTA at the time. It does need the consent of all existing contracting parties, but I imagine the existing EFTA state parties would not object, and it seems difficult to see why the Commission, on behalf of the other 27, should do so. So that's my very quick run-through of what I think the position will be. Uh, just lastly, I've given you some uh, references there. Uh, this is not the first time this has been thought about, of course. Professor Andrew Dickinson has written an article on it. Zara Masters and Belinda McRae of 20 Essex have written an article on it. I've just finished one writing with Andrew Dinsmore uh, on this topic, although we've also dealt with Rome 1 and Rome 2 and a little bit more in detail what the position of the CJEU is. That's going to come out at the end of the year. But that's the position as I see it at the moment. Thank you very much, Richard. Now, Richard touched on anti-suit injunctions, which some commentators have suggested might be available in a post-Brexit world. To tell us whether that's realistic or not, I'm now going to, we're now going to hear from Oliver. Right, no slides for me this evening. Hopefully go better than when Donald Trump was liberated from his teleprompters, but we'll soon see. I'm going to talk this evening about the impact Brexit may have on the availability of anti-suit injunctions, which is, of course, an injunction issued by the courts of this jurisdiction to stop proceedings taking place in a foreign jurisdiction. Now, for many of us, the anti-suit injunction featured quite heavily in our legal education. As a prime example, of the remedial power and flexibility of English law. Uh, but they've now been a somewhat rare occurrence in recent legal practice, uh, precisely because of the regime now embodied in the Brussels regulation, uh, which we are now uh, removing ourselves from through Brexit. So the departure from that regime, while causing many of us some despair, has at least given rise in some quarters to the perception of a ray of light shining through the storm clouds, a return of the prodigal son, the anti-suit injunction. Now, the anti-suit injunction is to some degree a juridical weapon built on judicial mistrust. At common law, it was available in two situations, where a party had a, a contract with an exclusive jurisdiction clause and the other party tried to bring proceedings elsewhere, or in a more amorphous category of case, where the other party's conduct could be seen as vexatious or oppressive, such as to constitute an equitable wrong. But it was always styled, um, despite this, not as an interference with the foreign court or its jurisdiction, but rather an interference with the other party to the contract through the exercise of the English court's in personam jurisdiction. Uh, but like so much judicial marmite, the European court hated that upon which the English courts had bestowed their love. And being an institution less concerned with nuance, it was not satisfied with the distinctions preferred by the English courts. The European regime, it was said, was one founded upon, upon a theory of mutual trust that represented the antithesis of the underlying rationale of the anti-suit injunction. And that was established by the ECJ in the case of Turner and Grovett which was uh, interpreting, as we'll come to later, the Brussels Convention. Now, although logically correct, I think it's fair to say that this approach has always uh, rankled a little bit with academics and practitioners, because it's built on a premise that we as English lawyers didn't really believe in, namely that all EU courts were created equal. Uh, those concerns were only exacerbated by the decision in West Tankers, which, as Richard has said, put an end to the use of anti-suit injunctions in arbitration, despite the specific carve-out 
uh, from the Brussels regulation for uh, matters concerned with arbitration. Now, those, uh, as Richard has, has noted, those tasked with negotiating the recast regulation sought to address the concerns that underpin the anti-suit injunction uh, in two ways. First, a provision was introduced uh, that would enable the chosen court to hear the dispute despite it being uh, a claim also being brought in the foreign jurisdiction, reversing the rule in Eric, Eric Gasser. Uh, and the second was to insert an additional recital, recital 12, addressing the arbitration exception, which has given rise to some hope that the, the anti-suit injunction might be back in the context of um, in the context of arbitration, and that arose in the in the case of Gazprom and Lithuania, um, where West Tankers wasn't rejected, but again there was some carve out in relation to anti-suit injunctions issued by arbitral tribunals themselves. Uh, so, with Brexit, what becomes of the anti-suit injunction? Uh, well, as already has already been discussed, it seems exceedingly unlikely that we'll be back to the common law. So the very small comfort some of us have sought to gain by saying that Brexit's not all bad, at least we'll have the anti-suit injunction back, um, is not likely to be very little comfort at all, unless that is one's uh, concerned with nefarious proceedings in Norway, Iceland, or other uh, Lugano Convention states. So what about then the Brussels Convention, which, at least at present, seems the most likely default option? Well, as I noted earlier, Turner and Grovert was actually decided on the basis of the Brussels Convention itself, and so that offers no hope for anti-suit injunctions. And of course, as has already been discussed under the Brussels Convention, the 1971 protocol means, one, means disputes in relation to that convention are still referred to the European Court. So not only does Brexit not mean Brexit, but the new rules will in fact be more restrictive than the ones we were abandoning. Now, what would a good deal look like for anti-suit injunctions? Well, if we somehow ended back uh, with the common law, that might be good for aficionados or fans of the anti-suit, but probably bad for any commercial lawyer who casts her gaze a little wider to look at the more broad uh, recognition and enforcement context. Uh, now, clearly, in so far as anti-suit injunctions are concerned, um, the default position under the Brussels Convention is also not desirable. So the best outcome in relation to issues concerned with the anti-suit would appear to be the UK re-signing up to the, Brussels, to the recast regulation. Uh, that would not bring with it the complete remedial freedom and flexibility of the common law, uh, being the jurisdiction in which the anti-suit was forged. Um, but it, and it's also true that the scope of the arbitration exception and possi the possibility of seeking anti-suit injunctions under the recast regulation uh, remains somewhat unclear. And so to the extent that there's any room for negotiation, these are things to be kept in mind. Uh, the reality is likely to be, however, uh, that as in so many other areas of Brexit negotiations, we're not able to pick out the plums and leave the duff behind. The price for reciprocity with other EU courts is likely to be deference to them in relation to the use of anti-suits. So finally, what should we do, what can we do in the meantime, above all to, to achieve the sort of certainty uh, that Julian was referring to earlier? Well, the primary focus in any commercial contract entered into now must be for, the, for a clear and exclusive English jurisdiction or arbitration clause. If we default back into the Brussels Convention regime, then this will still form a, a firm basis for jurisdiction, even if the court's powers are in other ways more limited. If we re-sign up to the recast regulation, it will give the English court power to carry on with proceedings despite the attempted Italian torpedo and possibly to proactively block foreign proceedings brought contrary to an arbitration clause. And if we end up back at the common law, this, this will give back to the English court power to block proceedings brought in breach of such a clause via the anti-suit injunction. Uh, at present, however, this seems more a hope built on nostalgia uh, 
uh, rather than practical reality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver. Now, there's not much point if you have a, um, a counterparty who does not have assets in the UK in agreeing to English jurisdiction unless you can be confident that the judgment of the English court is going to be enforceable wherever the assets might be found. So to consider what the options in relation to enforcement might be, I'll now hand over to Ben. Thank you, Helen. It was reported this morning that a councillor in Guildford has begun a gov.uk petition to amend the Treason Felony Act of 1868 to make conspiring with foreign powers to return Britain to the EU an act of treason. Um, I suspect on that basis Richard is off to Pentonville. Um, but I hope that uh, in advocating Britain signing up to Lugano after Brexit, at least for enforcement purposes, uh, I won't be joining him as a cellmate. Um, I'm going to cover really three and a half topics this evening. First, a brief rundown of the current system for enforcement under B1R. Um, second, identifying what's so good about that system, why we like it so much and therefore what we're looking for in a future system. Uh, and then third, a range of options for what we might do post-Brexit uh, and how they impact on enforcement before touching briefly on arbitration. So first, if you like, a brief refresher uh, on enforcement under B1R. And there are really four steps to enforcing any judgment. Um, first, obviously, the hard part, you have to obtain your original judgment. Second, under Article 53, you obtain a certified copy of that. At least in this jurisdiction, that's as simple as popping along to Master's Corridor uh, and getting the relevant stamp on your form. Third, and this is important and uh, a change under B1R, you take it direct to the enforcement authorities in the member state addressed uh, because the executor procedure uh, under the Convention, Lugano and Old Brussels one uh, has now been abolished. So you can be in Master's Corridor one day and a week later uh, attaching your ship in Italy or France or wherever it may be. And fourth, and only at that stage, you deal with any objections that might arise under Article 45 of the regulation raised by the party that you're enforcing against. So it really is very simple. So why, why is that system uh, so beneficial? Uh, well, there are really, I suppose, three, three merits to it. First, as noted, it's procedurally very straightforward. Under Articles 36 and 39 of B1R, no special procedure for either recognition or enforcement of your judgment is required. Second, it's very certain, or comparatively certain, as Julian touched on, that being something we're really looking for in any future solution. And, and the reason for that is that the defences available to enforcement of a judgment within the EU under B1R are very narrow. They're set out in Article 45, um, and in short, they are... Uh, being contrary to public policy, uh, judgment in default without the party addressed having been properly served, irreconcilability with the judgment of that or another member state, or, um, and this is actually something that applies under B1R and not under Lugano or the old Brussels Convention, being in conflict with the special jurisdiction rules for consumer insurance and employment contracts, things like the so-called large risks provisions for insurance and so on. So the second merit is that that's very narrow. It's extremely certain. Certainly no consideration of the merits, no issues of capacity or voidness of the agreement, that sort of thing. Third, uh, it's extremely powerful. Um, the range of judgments that is enforceable uh, under the regulation, the definition in Article 2A given of judgment is very wide, and the CJEU has widened that still further. So you can enforce an injunction, an interim order, a decision on jurisdiction, uh, or even an interim payment, which might be repayable automatically uh, in, in a foreign state. So those are, if you like, the merits of the system. How do we go about replicating them in whatever we do next? The underlying point to stress, I suppose, is that as some uh, commentators have suggested, it's all very well to say, well, 
Uh, the UK can simply recode whatever the best rules on jurisdiction are into its own law. And if they happen to be B1R, uh, then so much the better. The obvious difficulty with that, though, um, is that it says nothing about reciprocity and whether or not uh, other member states will be able, sorry, whether or not we will be able to take judgments of the English courts to other member states and enforce them in the same way as we can now. So Richard is almost certainly right. Uh, the, the best option for reciprocity and enforcement and enforceability is simply to retain Brussels 1. But whether or not that is politically viable remains to be seen. Perhaps the slightly more politically palatable option um, is to join Lugano 2007. Um, it, it's worth noting uh, that there is uh, some slim precedent uh, for a country that is neither an EU nor EEA slash EFTA member state being in Lugano. Um, there's, a, there's a prize uh, for anyone in the audience who can tell me what that precedent is. Well, no one is being uh, awarded the jar of Marmite, that most uh, potent post-Brexit commodity, uh, for knowing that between 1999 and 2004, Poland was actually in Lugano uh, before it had joined the EU or indeed EFTA. So there is at least some scope for that. Um, difficulties with Lugano from an enforcement perspective. Um, well, executor is still required, so you still have to go and get your judgment recognised uh, in, the, in the other member state before you can enforce it. That inevitably slows things down and creates more obstacles. And perhaps the flip side of that is that the grounds for refusal of uh, recognition and enforcement are in fact slightly narrower because they don't uh, apply the new uh, consumer employment and insurance provisions uh, of B1R. And of course, uh, Lugano is amendable potentially more easily um, than, uh, if you like, uh, the, the Brussels Convention or whatever Britain chooses to do bilaterally, unless Norway, Switzerland or Iceland are particularly wedded uh, to the executor procedure, it's entirely possible we'll be able to shape Lugano somewhat. Um, we might well default back to the Brussels Convention, um, perhaps not quite as good as, as being in Lugano, although uh, roughly the same, um, except amendability. Um, so again, no cause for panic there. Perhaps where, from an enforcement perspective, things become a bit thornier is, for instance, if we're left out in the cold relying on uh, the Hague Choice of Courts Convention, which at the moment applies as between the EU, Mexico and Singapore, um, from an enforcement perspective, Article 9 of that convention has fairly wide grounds for refusing enforcement. Um, essentially, what the drafters seem to have done is copied out the relevant bits of B1R and the relevant bits of the New York Convention on arbitration. Um, so you really have the greatest possible range of defences, um, which might not be entirely desirable. Um, that looks like it might, if you like, be a bit of a mess. Um, there is, of course, the possibility of further bilateral arrangements that might be negotiated. Um, but really, from an enforcement perspective, what we absolutely want to avoid, if at all possible, is a reversion to the common law. Um, because, of course, as anyone who's uh, tried to enforce a Russian or Chinese or indeed American judgment in this jurisdiction knows, um, it is a much potentially much slower and more difficult process um, than enforcing under the regulation, um, given that you have to commence fresh proceedings and effectively seek summary judgment uh, on that judgment uh, as akin to a contract debt. Um, and there are a couple of cases on the handout that set out some of the difficulties there. So that is, if you like, uh, in descending order, um, the uh, options uh, for what we might do uh, and how they might affect enforcing your judgments. Finally, a word on arbitration. Um, obviously, one, one thing that uh, arbitration practitioners in particular have been keen to emphasise since Brexit uh, is that the New York Convention, which has, at least for enforcement purposes, notwithstanding ambiguities about the arbitration uh, exception and so on, um, is powerful, is unaffected by Brexit, um, and also contains different, albeit still relatively narrow, grounds for refusal under Article 5, um, and is relatively widely observed. That said, before rushing to insert arbitration clauses into all of your agreements, it's worth bearing in mind that the chances are that one way or another, uh, enforcement of a proper English exclusive jurisdiction clause, um, or a, rather a judgment 
pursuant to one of those um, is still going to be relatively easy. So don't despair uh, and don't rush off to do that just yet. Thank you very, thank you very much, Ben. Now, um, before I open it up to discussion, last but by no means least, uh, Andrew is going to tell us a little bit about one European regulation that sometimes gets forgotten in this context, the evidence regulation, and then also draw some threads of the points that have been made together. Andrew. Thank you. Uh, this is the trouble with going last. I calculate I have minus 10 minutes to speak to you. Um, so I'm going to speak for minus 10 minutes on those two topics. So first of all, taking evidence abroad. Um, at the moment, we can do this in the EU, apart from Denmark, under the evidence regulation, regulation 1206-2001. How will that change after Brexit if nothing is done? The short answer is that the pre-existing convention procedures should apply, but they're not quite as good. And those uh, include, in particular, the 1970 Hague Convention on Taking Evidence Abroad. Um, once we cease to be a member state, uh, that convention should continue to apply. But what, what are the problems? Uh, there are four key points. Uh, first, not everyone is a party. The, the larger member states are parties. Belgium and Austria aren't, but we have older bilateral conventions with them dating from 1922 and 1931. But if you want evidence from Ireland, you'll be back under an 1856 statute, which um, does provide for oral evidence, but not for production of documents. The second point is speed. This is perhaps the main point. The current evidence regulation is fairly streamlined. It requires the overseas court to take the evidence within 90 days or explain why it can't. A, a 2007 European Commission report found that time limit was usually, although not always, met, and overall the process was faster than it had been before. There's no, there's no time limit under the Hague Convention, and it often takes well over six months. The third point is that um, under the evidence regulation, we have slightly clearer rights for the parties or the representatives to actually take part in the taking of the evidence, um, whereas uh, uh, the, under the Hague Convention, you only have a right to be present. Um, and then lastly, under the evidence regulation, the requesting court can itself directly go and take the evidence overseas, provided the witness agrees. Um, several members of chambers earlier this year did a case where the judge, parties, and uh, lawyers all went over to Paris to take evidence from the main defendant. So overall, Brexit here will leave us with slower and less comprehensive arrangements unless we can negotiate something equivalent to the evidence regulation. So now my second topic, which I've called, uh, can we fix it or do we need the UK government to intervene? If you came to our previous seminar on international trade, you may have got a sense of just how enormous a task the UK faces in negotiating deals for us to carry on trading with EU nationals. Uh, you may suspect that today's subject, how we can carry on suing each other, will come rather lower down the agenda. So that's one reason for focusing on the fairly basic and mostly obvious things clients can do to mitigate the effect of Brexit in this area. In the table, which is nearly at the back of the handout, um, the thing that has color, color on it, yellow and orange, uh, red and orange rather, um, I've tried to summarize precautions that can be taken using red for critical steps and yellow for important steps. Um, but still, there are some things the parties can't fix for themselves. And here we do have to look to the government to negotiate a workable substitute for the current arrangements. And I'd just like to pick out five key points. First one, which is topics two and three in the table, uh, relates to jurisdiction. And as Richard has explained, the default position after Brexit is we probably re resort to the Brussels Convention. Um, that doesn't necessarily present a problem in terms of the English court taking jurisdiction, but it, it does create problems where we're threatened with action overseas. Uh, in other words, the torpedo. Uh, as I've said there, under the subheading pre-dispute precautions, an exclusive jurisdiction clause should be agreed wherever possible. 
and in theory that should stop a preemptive strike by the contractual counterparty. I, I believe that, for example, the French and German courts tend to respect jurisdiction clauses, but we know that's not how matters always work out. And of course the problem under the Brussels Convention is that the court first seized is left to decide whether the jurisdiction clause applies. So in one case I was involved in, we were assured that the court of Milan would decide that our client's fairly straightforward claim for breach of contract um, actually raised fundamental norms of Italian law, uh, and that would mean that the court would say the jurisdiction clause was overridden or simply didn't apply. The Milanese court would retain jurisdiction and indeed dismiss the claim. So the infamous torpedo could not only cause great delay, but actually hold your case below the waterline and sink it. Now that sort of situation was bad for clients, and it was bad for the UK dispute resolution industry. Uh, and it's a great irony of the current situation that the Ministry of Justice in particular did an excellent job in negotiating the new provisions in the recast Brussels regulation, doing away with the Gasser decision that was mentioned and letting the chosen court proceed to hear the case. So if we're back with the torpedo, what that will mean in practice is having to advise clients sometimes to start proceedings here quickly and perhaps more quickly than would otherwise be sensible. The second point is severability. The recast Brussels 1 regulation says in Article 25.5 that a jurisdiction clause is severable from any attack on the contract as a whole. So if someone alleges, for example, duress, that doesn't affect the clause unless the duress was specifically directed at the jurisdiction clause. Now that doctrine is already part of English law, but if we go back to the Brussels Convention, which is silent on this point, then EU courts may feel able to ignore jurisdiction clauses where there's an attack on the contract as a whole. Uh, third point is a short point, which is that, the, as Richard has mentioned, the Brussels Convention would leave a lacuna in relation to Switzerland, Norway, and Iceland. <clears throat> Fourth point is uh, the problem with arbitration. The provisions in the recast Brussels regulation, Article uh, Recital 12 in particular, are certainly not perfect, but they do at least make one thing clear, and that is that if proceedings are started in a court, other than in the country where the arbitration is supposed to happen, and that court declares the arbitration agreement void, then its judgment will not be enforceable under the regulation. And so there's nothing to stop the arbitration going ahead, being converted, if necessary, into a court judgment, provided that happens before the rogue member state court itself hands down any judgment on the merits. Now, if we go back to the Brussels Convention, which is silent on these points, the position will be in flux once again. Um, then the fifth and last point is enforcement, which Ben has spoken about. Uh, in the default Brexit situation, in other words, Brexit and nothing is done to fix it, then parties will have to take a view about whether we're right that the Brussels, Brussels Convention still applies. If it does, then the position will be broadly similar to what we have now. If, we don't, if it doesn't apply, of course, then our clients will face a patchwork of bilateral arrangements, in some cases no arrangement at all, and we'll have to get some local advice. And here it would be critical again for the government to act. Um, so those are the key points I wanted to highlight. I hope the rest of the table is self-explanatory, but I'll do my best to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Andrew. Well, inevitably, there, we've had to rush through some really quite knotty topics. Um, but what we were hoping to do was to open the um, floor to provoke some debate about some of these issues and also to see if there are any questions which we haven't uh, managed to touch on uh, to which people would like to see if we have any answers amongst our panel. Uh, we have a mic, so please uh, do just put your hand up and we'll bring you the mic before you start speaking. Any questions? The gentleman. <laughs> 
I've got a question about the enforcement of judgments. Uh, because my firm did a Brexit kind of uh, session for a financial institution clients about a week or so ago. And we had about 70 people in all, and we asked them to put their hand up if anyone but it had to uh, enforce um, a member state court judgment in another member state. And only two people put their hands up. And so that might suggest that enforcement as such in the pure form is, is not so important. I don't know what the experience in this room is like or, or indeed of the panel. Um, it, it also seems to me that the, the, the big thing about the English court is it the way it enforces judgments is through receiverships, contempt, whatever. That's what gives it its power, not actually cross-border enforcement. So I wonder whether we need be so concerned about cross-border enforcement. Liam, would you like to address that? Um, I, I think it's something which is, which at the moment, uh, you're probably right that there are a lot of there's a lot of talk about enforcement being a big issue. I think in, in my uh, in my practice, corporate side of things, uh, disputes uh, if they're heard in the UK courts, there will be enforcement issues around other jurisdictions, whether it's whether it's the EU or actually further afield. Um, there are um, I, ha I mean I've certainly set, been involved in situations where enforcement has been sought elsewhere. Um, I think at the moment the the only issue that, that, that we're really debating a lot at at our um, firm is the fact that this that this is a this is a subject which is causing a lot of people to to debate it, uh, and and I think it is giving giving rise to some some questions about whether or not it is a big issue or not. I mean, I personally think uh, we uh, we do think it is an issue that needs to be addressed, uh, and at the moment, whether or not as a practical matter, it's universally something which necessarily flows from from judgments is a different point but I think if you if you lose the ability to enforce judgments uh, across the EU then I suspect uh, that will be an issue for someone at some point so I mean I think personally we, we, we probably do need to address it I think perhaps I could add to that from my experience I litigated many cases where there have been EU <laughs> registered parties on the other side and because the regime is so clear uh, one doesn't find problems on enforcement. The cases I've litigated where there have been problems on enforcement are cases where the party's assets are actually located in an area where there isn't a clear regime. And I think, therefore, just judging it on the basis of how many enforcement actions there are in other member states at the moment is probably a false assessment. Uh, there might also be a perception issue. Obviously, if, um, if we do end up under the Brussels Convention, then by and large we can still enforce. But if, if enforcement is seen as a problem, then it might just make people that much more reluctant to choose English law and jurisdiction, which would be unfortunate. Any other yes, just in front of you. Um, I, I just wanted to add um, one other urgent matter to Richard Aiken's list to take up with the government lawyers. And that is, of course, cross-border insolvency and the European insolvency regulation, which is going to be even more deeply problematic um, following Brexit. And I don't know if anyone um, on the panel has given any thought to that. I don't know if you've got any experience of cross-border insolvency, but the current regime has been elaborately worked out, and um, I foresee a considerable amount of chaos um, in a couple of years' time. Well, I believe we have quite a few government lawyers in the room who no doubt will be adding that to their growing list. Uh, other questions on jurisdiction, conflict of laws? Thank you, um, and thanks to the panel for their insights. I think we're all agreed on the benefits of B1R, but assuming we're cast back into the dark days of the convention, whether anyone on the panel thought there was a possibility of the ECJ applying the policy of, the, of B1R um, and taking into account cases under B1R to create an interpretive channel tunnel through the fog? <laughs> well, I think there's, there's certainly a prospect of that in relation to the arbitration recital, I think, because um, if you apply a purposive construction, it may well be thought that the new recital 12 in the recast regulation is in fact just um, telling everyone what they thought it meant in the first place. And so there might be some hope in that regard of um, adopting the reasoning in Gazprom in, in the old Brussels Convention. I think in, in relation to things like Eric Gasser and the new Article 31, I think that's going to be very difficult because um, certainly the negotiations got us out of that straitjacket. And um, 
it's very difficult, even the, the ECJ, to interpret its way out of that one. And there is one small example of the court having done it, I think, which is in uh, the Brussels Convention in the tort provision talked about the place where harm occurred and the B1R adds or may occur, so it covers threatened torts. And in the Henkel case, the Court of Justice looked at, amongst other things, the B1R in deciding that the same was the position under the Brussels Convention. Um, so there is a precedent for it happening, uh, although, uh, as Oliver says, whether that would go as far as um, getting rid of GASA, I would be rather doubtful. And as Professor Adrian Briggs has said rather tartly in an article, the European Court is quite capable of completely disregarding a decision it's already made, so uh, there may be hope there. Um, Br Brussels Convention deals with jurisdiction enforcement of judgments, of course, but not service. I can remember when it my, uh, when we first started dealing with all this you know, years ago, it was all very well. We'd have our jurisdiction. We knew we could enforce the judgment. But how do we on earth do we serve this document in Germany, for example, where they wouldn't allow service unless the documents were vetted by a German federal um, bureau in German, and they would then decide whether or not they were going to allow you to serve it. So the, as I recall, the service convention came into force in, a, in about 1990 five-ish. I can't remember what, what it was called, but um, it, would we go back to that as well as a default on service? Well, uh, Andrew, perhaps would you have addressed that? Um, well, uh, yes, now we've got the service regulation, but that, that will presumably fall away if it's not replaced after Brexit, and so we will be back under the old regime. Um, there's, there is the old 1965 Hague procedure, which it, um, as those of you who have tried it will know is, is pretty uh, stately. Um, other than that, I think it's, it will be a question of taking local advice because uh, in a number of EU member states you can use in more informal methods of service like post or bailiff service. Uh, so it is a question of taking each case as it comes, I think. But yes, it would be much less satisfactory. Any other Questions or thoughts? Yes, at the back of the room. Yes, um, just one observation listening. So the, the comment that was made about, the, about insolvency prompted in me the thought that before, that the current European arrangements are based on the old Council of, uh, uh, Council of Europe bankruptcy convention, which since I happened to negotiate, I remember, um, and prompted the thought, listening to you, that um, we are uh, that Brexit does not mean leaving the Council of Europe. There remains one European, therefore one European institution, uh, which has still got some interest in uh, by that, in European uh, judicial cooperation, and. I, I simply don't know, but I, I just throw out the thought that there might be, in, when thinking about reverting to pre-existing regimes, one might just reflect on what has the Council of Europe done over the years, because it had quite a large part in discussion of quite a lot of these arrangements, actually, and might be quite a useful trawl for um, future um, points. The, the other point I wanted to ask the panel was um, around um, a fairly esoteric point, which is uh, public policy exceptions in treaties. So my recollection um, is that uh, there remains exceptions um, in uh, currently on um, enforcement for, for example, tax laws. Um, so one state not enforcing another's tax law. And I suppose one of the questions I ask is, well, my question is, is there, uh, you know, when thinking about l l loss of some of these judicial cooperation mechanisms, one also needs to think about what it means in terms of interpreting something like that. Because at the moment, you've got a judicial 
policy across Europe, which presumably will give you a lot more consistency with what would be or would not be accepted as a public policy um, that you could enforce through private measures. But I, I just wonder whether something like that, one should flag that some of those kinds of arrangements may not um, remain applicable in a slightly more hostile world. Thank you, Ben. Um, I think that point is very fair. Obviously, in relation to the tax laws example specifically, um, that, that's carved out of B1R in a way that it's not, for instance, uh, in the New York Convention, if you had an arbitration award that might conflict with a, a local tax law. And obviously, all of the potential alternatives, um, apart from, strictly speaking, the common law, um, which will apply that, that anyway, contain a public policy exception. Um, but it's absolutely right to note that the, the meaning of that might differ. Um, I suppose the, the, the small comfort that uh, I can offer is that at least in relation to, to all of them, there is a, a decent body of jurisprudence, for instance, as to what public policy means under the New York Convention or the Brussels Convention, uh, as the case may be. Um, and so to that extent, the scope for uncertainty isn't, isn't perhaps as great as some might think. Any other? Yes, of course, Julian. So I just add something that which is which is not necessarily strictly on point, but certainly going back to some of the things I was talking about earlier in terms of the use of uh, English law in in certain types of uh, securities offerings. Uh, one of the issues that we we deal with is partly a public policy point, uh, but also a conflict of law point, um, which is uh, the jurisdiction clause in in a typical securities law offering will have. I call them uneven jurisdiction clauses, but I think they're actually called unilateral mm. jurisdiction clauses, which I'm sure you're aware is uh, the ability of, in, in the case of securities offerings, <laughs> the banks to, to uh, uh, bring proceedings in any jurisdiction, uh, whereas the issuer is, is limited to bringing claims against the banks just in the UK. And the purpose of that is to ensure that if the banks are uh, the subject of proceedings in a jurisdiction that they've facilitated the sale of securities into by a local investor, they're not exposed to the possibility of uh, having to bring a claim that was made against them in a foreign court back to the English courts to try and recover from the issuer in circumstances where the English courts, as a matter of public policy or otherwise, say we're not going to re we're going to change the, the level of damages because we don't agree with the way in which that court's applied. Uh, from, the, from the point of view of the English court. So that's something which we, we use quite a lot in securities offerings, this, this concept of uh, unilateral jurisdiction clauses to avoid that very, at that very risk. Sorry, um, well, two more, perhaps, and then just behind you, Paul. Um, I just wondered, under the new Brussels regulations, um, there's obviously the provisions, Articles 31 and 32, which allow member states to stay their proceedings in favour of uh, proceedings brought in a non-member state. Uh, it's discretionary, um, and I know that there was, that was subject to a fair amount of debate, debate when it was inserted, but I just wondered what, what the panel's view was on England trying to perhaps benefit from that in, in, in trying to avoid parallel proceedings across the EU even if we don't have the Brussels uh, regulation, whether we can still benefit from their protection? Well, I, I can't see um, really how, how easy it would be to deal with it, because I think that the, the, the current uh, B1R it is, is pretty restrictive, isn't it, on, on when you can actually get a stay of uh, a, a member state, in a member state court, in favor of a third party court, if you like to call it that. And, and I suspect that uh, that was um, something that was very hard fought and hard won. Doing anything more than that, I think, would be very difficult. Uh, and the, the danger is, of course, that if we, if we don't have B1R, then, and we're thrown back on uh, uh, Brussels Convention, um, I, I can't see what, what scope there is, unless the English court simply were to uh, almost disregard the, the previous um, uh, jurisprudence of the uh, CJEU and ECJ. It, 
it does raise a, 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 a basic question, <laughs> which we obviously haven't had time to go into tonight, which is uh, what will be the status of past decisions of the European Court post Brexit, uh, and, and uh, will they will they remain binding? Or all the time, or will they merely be something which is persuasive? Uh, and it's quite a difficult point, and it's going to depend on the nature of the regime that is actually decided, I think. Uh, but uh, th there is certainly an argument for saying, uh, rather as with when, um, when, say, Ireland became independent in 1922, that what was decided beforehand in the House of Lords in London, even when it was an Irish case, was no longer binding. But I'm not sure that the English courts, or indeed any UK courts, would take that view. So I think uh, it really is a case of fog in channel there. Now, having organised this evening, I'm going... Don't... You don't... Oh, great. Finn appeared to be wanting to ask a question. Uh, so that then just remains to me to thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, we very much appreciate you braving the uh, elements to do so. And then to ask you all to join me in thanking our panel in the usual way. <laughs>